Welcome back. Welcome back. I'm joined now by a man who's been described as one of the gurus of modern physics. He's the physicist, television presenter, and internationally best-selling author, Professor Michio Kaku. In his latest book, Physics of the Impossible, he reveals how things that we've always believed to be impossible, like time travel, invisibility, and extraterrestrial life, may actually lie within the known laws of physics. Sounds like something out of the new Star Trek film. Is this what the future will look like? Locking torpedoes. Emergency evasive. Fire everything! And Professor Michio Kaku joins me now. Magic. Magic or physics? Physics, perhaps. that's right. Physics. Physics, chemistry, acrobatics. Tell me, um, in terms of the subjects that are in your book, which obviously is talking about the impossible, but which of the things you write about, like time travel, invisibility, teleportation, telekinesis, perpetual motion machines, and so on, which are the most possible to actually happen within our lifetime or people's lifetime? Not just within a lifetime, within the next coming years. Uh, invisibility research, research in telepathy. These are the cutting edge areas of research. Uh, invisibility, for example. Yes, how does that work? Well, we used to think that light cannot wrap around Harry Potter and come out the other end, like water wrapping around a boulder. Impossible, we thought. But then at Imperial College three years ago and Duke University, we did it for microwave radiation. And just this year for visible light, we've now shown that visible light in principle can also bend around an object. So Harry Potter, watch out. We're going to get that cloak sooner than you think. Right. And what, what will that do for us when we can do that? Well, what, what, what use will it have? Well, first of all, a new law of optics is emerging through what are called metamaterials, creating what are called super microscopes. We're going to be able to peer right inside a DNA molecule and revolutionize medicine by being able to see genes as they work. Now, right now, the funding for a lot of this research comes from the military. Let's be clear about this. They see the potential of an invisible soldier. But eventually, this could become commercial. It could become commonplace that we may be able to be have invisible things uh, beamed uh, right, right in our living room. Now, this answers several questions. Uh, some people think, for example, that time travel is not possible because we're the tourists from the future. How would you define time travel for people? Being able to go backwards in time, into the past. So if time travel is possible for the future, how come they don't visit us? Maybe they're invisible. Maybe that's why, because we're going to have invisibility easily within the coming decades, well within our lifetime. But what about time travel? How would that work? What needs to be done to make that work? Well, you need a fuel. You need gasoline, more than a DeLorean like in the movies. Yeah. You need something called <laughs> negative energy. You take Einstein's equations, you put negative energy inside, and bingo, time curls up like a pretzel. So one thing that we once thought to be impossible is now physically possible if you have large quantities of negative energy. Now that may take centuries, not in our lifetime. Maybe our descendants will be able to harvest enough negative energy to, to go backwards in time. And what about teleportation and things like that? We once thought that too was impossible, but now we've done it. In, it, 10 years ago, we took a laser beam, particles of light, and zapped it across the room. The world's record now is 600 meters across the Danube River in Austria. Atoms were teleported recently. And we're also filming the book, Physics of the Impossible, for the Science Channel and ITV. And we filmed an atom being teleported last week. We can now zap individual atoms right across the room. Now, molecules will what come very exactly? soon. You zap it. You zap it across the room, and how do you know when it's worked? Well, we actually televised it. We actually had the TV camera focus in on one chamber with an atom, another chamber with another atom, and the screen lit up when the teleportation took place. And again, this is only on the atomic scale. We hope next to put carbon dioxide, H2O, inside these chambers. Maybe eventually a gene. Maybe eventually living tissue. That's further down the line. But teleportation at the atomic level, we've done that. We've been there. What about robots? 
Robots is a disappointment, okay? We're making enormous strides in telepathy, invisibility, ray guns, teleportation. We underestimated how sophisticated the brain is. Uh, the brain is not a digital computer. Uh, the brain has no Pentium chip. There's no software, there's no Windows. Our brain is a learning machine. It rewires itself after learning a task. Computers can't do that. Computers can't rewire themselves. Our most advanced robot has the intelligence of a cockroach, by the way. Oh. <laughs> and eventually, we'll get them as smart as a rabbit. But that'll take uh, many, many years of hard work to get them as smart as a rabbit. And in your world, uh, in your fascinating world, is there room for a creator, a god, or do you think not? Believe it or not, with the Large Hadron Collider debuting later this year in Geneva, Switzerland, the largest machine in the world, we're going to have essentially a look at the instant of creation itself. And then the question is, what happened before the Big Bang? What happened before Genesis chapter 1, verse 1? We're going to be able to have a glimpse of the pre-Big Bang universe to answer these questions. Is there a God that set the universe into motion. Thank you very much indeed. My pleasure. Thank you for being with us. Coming back to the present now, with the world's attention fixed on the unfolding credit crisis, some governments have been tempted to focus on economics to the exclusion of human rights. But that's a mistake, according to Amnesty International anyway, whose annual report was published this week. The two, they say, are entwined. What they call a human rights time bomb underlines this whole economic crisis. Well, to explain what they mean by that, I'm joined by the General Secretary of Amnesty International. Warm welcome back to Irene Khan. Irene, welcome. Uh, where, where did they coalesce or come together or react against one another? Human rights on the one hand and the credit crisis on the other. Well, you know, our report covers 157 countries. What about the other ones? Well, they are not covered only because we don't have the resources to cover them. I see, because some papers have referred to the fact that Norway is a champion human rights country because they're not mentioned in here. But, that, but that's not true that's at all. That's not true. Who are the other ones? Difficult ones? Uh, uh, some of them, like Costa Rica, is not covered this year. Uh, but that's simply because we just didn't have the time or the money to, to do it. But what that report shows is that the economic crisis has made the human rights crisis worse because the poor have got poorer. Uh, millions of people have been forcibly evicted from their homes, many of them in slums, marginalized communities, indigenous peoples. We've seen the food crisis getting worse, food prices going up, and governments in North Korea, Zimbabwe, uh, Myanmar, manipulating the shortage of food to starve people. So it's, it's making those things worse. Those things worse. What's also happened is in 17 countries in the world, we've documented people coming out in the streets to demonstrate against the terrible social and economic conditions. And governments have clamped down very harshly on them. A hundred people were shot dead in Cameroon. Two people were killed in Tunisia. Several hundred arrested. Uh, hundreds of people injured. So we actually see the recession leading to more repression, particularly in countries where governments don't tolerate dissent in any case. And in fact, in general, across the whole sphere, and, and heightened by what you were saying about the credit crunch, but I mean, as you look back a year or two before the credit crunch, I mean, every year, are things improving? Are things getting better for human rights around the world? Is there less for you to be angry about? Or are things getting worse? Well, in some areas, we've seen progress. We've seen progress, for example, on the abolition of the death penalty more than 110 countries no longer execute people. We've seen progress, uh, for instance, in international justice. The International Criminal Court opened its first trial uh, with Lubanga from Congo for recruitment of child soldiers this year. Uh, so, and, and we've seen uh, Fujimori convicted last year in Peru. So there is progress, but at the same time, there are very complex human rights problems now emerging because of the economic crisis, because conflicts around the world are getting more entrenched. Uh, the Sri Lankan situation right now, several hundred thousand people still without international access, uh, without in, uh, humanitarian aid, even though the war is over. And we see examples of more torture, torture in some countries in the West that never did it before. Um, I mean, that's a bad development. But maybe there are other parts of the world where there's less torture. 
Well, we looked at the G20, the record of the G20 governments, and we found that 15 of the 19 countries reflected in the G20 practice torture or condone torture. That's a pretty depressing statistic, considering that the G20 are the world's leaders now. The United States, um, obviously, in many ways, is uh, a leading leading democracy, and the torture question is a is a an awful one. Uh, but I mean, it does get an awful lot of space. Is that just be in the book? Uh, is that just because it is the biggest, most powerful country in the world? Well, the United States has to show leadership. It's, it is the biggest, most powerful country in the world, and therefore what the United States does sends a very important message. We welcomed very much President Obama's decision within 48 hours of taking office to close Guantanamo, to condemn torture, um, to end secret detention by the CIA. Uh, and that was a very good, positive, strong message to the rest of the world. And I just hope he keeps down that track and uh, really closes and discloses everything that happened uh, during the war on terror. Thank you very much, Irene, for being with us. And uh, we look forward to seeing you when the next annual report comes out. And I hope you'll be reporting lots of progress. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed to Irene Khan there. And that's it for this week. A big political week coming up next week. So in seven days' time, among others, I'll be talking to Carl Bildt about the European elections and to Saeed Erekat about President Obama's much-trumpeted speech in Egypt. Do join us then. <laughs>